Okay, everyone. Welcome to our uh, webinar series here at the City University of New York School of Professional Studies. I'm your host. This is Ellen Shakespeare, the Academic Director of the Health Information Management Program here at CUNY SPS. So today we're going to be seeing a presentation called Putting the Pieces Together, Creating Effective Quantitative Presentations for HIM. And this is the third and final one for this fall semester 2013. Um, some of you may have been with us since the beginning in the spring. Uh, we had three presentations in the spring of 2013. Um, and all of these, uh, these webinar uh, recordings have been posted on our CUNY SPS YouTube channel. So if you've missed any of them, you can certainly go back and take, uh, take a peek at some of them. I have had actually one faculty member at a different college tell me they've been making it mandatory, a mandatory reading or reviewing for some of the students in their class. Um, but if you have employees that you like to share, share this with, um, Mike's really done a great job with these presentations. So um, well, let's get started. So here's my commercial. This, as I said, this is the City University of New York, the School of Professional Studies. We come under the Graduate Center at CUNY, and CUNY has 23 different campuses. We are separate and apart from any of the other campuses, but we do report to the Graduate Center. Um, we have a baccalaureate and HIM program that we started a little over a year or so ago. Uh, we are in candidacy with KHIM, which is the accrediting body for all HIM programs, HIM, HIT programs. We expect to be accredited in the early spring, and that once, once that is complete, that will allow our students to sit for the RHIA exam. We are essentially a fully online program. I do have to mention that students do have to complete one practicum during the time that they are with us, and a practicum uh, sort of equals an internship. So that is something that we will arrange for the student, and that is usually done as the very last class in the program. That is the one component that really is not online, but it is a mandatory component. So the good news is that there is no out-of-state tuition for online programs at SBS. All students pay in-state rates, which is really a great bargain if you are at all looking around at what tuition rates are these days. So I have very experienced faculty working with me. They're not only experienced in HIM, but they are experienced in online education. So this is the link where you can find a little bit about, a little more about our program. One thing I do need to mention, we are fortunate enough to be able to go forward in spring of 2014 and possibly be able to present some more of these types of webinars. Okay, and here's my contact information. A little bit, uh, just another little commercial about an MS in data analytics program that we have here at CUNY SPS also. Total of 12 courses, and as you, as you are working out in the field of HIM and HIT, you know that analytics is here and it's here to stay. So here is some of the um, information about that given program. So today I want to present, uh, to, to introduce you again to your presenter, Mike Guerra. Mike has been doing all these wonderful webinars for us over the last year, and he's really done a fantastic job. Mike is a partner with Healthcare PC Training. He's been in the um, healthcare field for around 30 years, and he's very knowledgeable about um, the interoperations of not only HIM, but uh, patient accounts and computer services and all that. So he, he's, an, he's an insider. So anyway, Mike, thanks again for your um, your presentation, and I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ellen. I hope that everybody can hear me, and I hope that you all are having a nice day wherever you are. It's a lovely day here in New York, and I hope that you are in a good frame of mind to be able to discuss Microsoft PowerPoint, and not simply discussing PowerPoint, but talking about how we can both use PowerPoint a bit more efficiently and how we can use PowerPoint in tandem with many of the other different software products that are out there uh, today. So that's really our, our objective today is to really look at PowerPoint as a presentation tool. I'm sure many of you have used it before. Uh, probably very few of you are new to the world of PowerPoint. But I want, to uh, I want us to look at it in the context of how it fits in 
to all of the other software products, Excel, Access, Word, um, any, and some of the other um, non-Microsoft products that are out there as well. So that's really our agenda. I want to begin by uh, two very important acknowledgments. First of all, uh, the HIM professionals that I've worked for, with over the many years that I've been in this profession, really I could not do this presentation or most of my work uh, without their influence and their collective guidance. So I do want to acknowledge that. And I also want to give a shout out to a colleague of mine, Betsy Canelli, who works for Orange Regional Medical Center. Um, Betsy was the one who really came up with the idea of this, uh, what, what, we, what we originally called putting the pieces together type of a uh, presentation where users would be exposed to PowerPoint as a function of how it could be used with Excel and Word and Access and all the others. So I want to acknowledge uh, her very important contribution in the conceptual design of what we're going to be talking about today. Well, let's begin at the beginning. Typical uses for Microsoft PowerPoint in the HIM world. You're familiar with all the different typical things, monthly, quarterly, and annual reports, um, committee meetings, presentations for committee meetings, um, M&M, that, that, that sort of thing. Uh, clinical scorecards, we're all familiar with present, presenting data in, in that re regard. Um, Sometimes individuals are uh, use PowerPoint for doing uh, productivity reporting, both in terms of employees and in terms of processes. Of course, there are always the departmental budgets that we're exposed to, and various ad hoc presentations for administrative report. I would dare say that most of you probably have used PowerPoint many times for some or all of these items. Um, many other uses uh, for PowerPoint and we're going to explore some of those today. But before we begin with how to use it, I want to point out some of the common mistakes that people make in putting together PowerPoint presentations. Um, the, and the, the, the common mistakes that I, I've, I've seen are really just a function of th things that, that I've observed as well as the students that I've trained over the years um, have, have made um, and, and, and as well as individual questions that have come to me in terms of uh, the use of, of PowerPoint. And so um, I, I just want to point these out. As they are not the definitive word. Um, they are just simply my observations. Of, first of all, how many of us have gone to presentations where there are just too many slides? Um, and, and one of the things to remember is that the users and, and, and the audience of any presentation, no matter how compelling that presentation may be, has a limited attention span. <laughs> Excuse me. That goes along with too much information uh, that we try to frequently impart in PowerPoint presentations. Um, a lot of times if individuals use charts, they make them far too complex and and even just in terms of real estate too, too small to be able to be read by an audience in a pre presentation situation. Um, there frequently is a lack of data integration between the slides uh, and, and that becomes problematic when you are presenting material that is of a complex uh, nature and so we see this all the time. This all comes down to an inability to maintain the user's interest in the topic at hand and uh, what we gen gen usually refer to as user fatigue. Not that they will fall asleep on you, although that has been known to happen, uh, but that they just simply lose interest and aren't able to walk away with something from that presentation. That really is what I've noticed before uh, in, in, in many years of doing presentations and attending presentations that the, the speaker hasn't defined a clear takeaway. What is it that he or she wants their audience to walk away with from that presentation? Um, put another way, you know, all of these things contribute to death by PowerPoint. I'm sure you have all heard about uh, the, um, th this phenomenon where you attend a presentation and the, the lights go off, the PowerPoint comes up, and now all, everybody goes to sleep. And so the, frequently these are the, the result of, of uh, many of the things that you see above as well as a lot of other things. So that, th these are just some things to avoid when creating PowerPoint presentations. Well today what we're going to do is we're going to 
proceed with a, an approach that I'm calling less is more, and that is to say, how can we streamline the PowerPoint presentations in such a way that we can have a greater impact, but yet maybe present a little bit less information, and what information we do present make it a bit less cluttered. That really is one of the pet peeves I have about PowerPoint, is that frequently the users um, make their screens, their slides, so cluttered that they're really difficult to, to work with and really difficult to, uh, take, uh, to take anything away. Now, this comes to, uh, to, this speaks to the whole issue of using the right tool for the right job. It's been said that if the whole world looked like a nail, then the only tool you'd have would be a hammer. And the reality is that we have so many tools today. We have Excel for spreadsheets. We have Word for text. We have Access for uh, databases. We have Excel for uh, data manipulation. And so one of the things that I want you to think about as you go, as we go through today's presentation is using the right tool for the right job. Um, integrating PowerPoint with Word, with Excel, with Access, with um, data that you might pull down from the web. Um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm going to take you through is a, a, a different way of creating a presentation. Um, most of us are very familiar with the whole uh, usage of slides in a PowerPoint presentation. Presentation. Not many of us are as familiar with the presentation, the concept of presenting data or creating our PowerPoint in an outline form and then taking that outline form and crafting it into a presentation. So I'm going to show you a, what, what for some of you will be, I think, a different approach to creating a presentation, but I think it will be effective. And um, I'm, I've been told by other people who have uh, seen this that, that it, it, it does make sense for some individuals. Um, for example, if you're creating an annual report, you might be pulling data from text, some text descriptions from Word, or uh, some data uh, regarding uh, the um, information on the um, from from Excel. The um, one of the things that we need to do is when we're pulling information from ex, uh, from uh, different sources, Word, Excel, Access, we need to pull it from, and, and then once we get it into PowerPoint, we need to be able to manipulate it. And so that's one of the things that you might be able to do, and you might be able to work with your, uh, when, when creating a report that makes a little bit more sense. Okay, and lastly, we'll have a time for questions and answers. All right, presentation takeaway. What is it that I want you to take away from this presentation? Okay, well, what is it that I want as, a, as the presenter? What is it that I want you to remember? When you leave this, this presentation in about an hour, I want you to have something particular in mind. And, and we should all think about that when we're crafting a PowerPoint presentation. One of the things I like to do when I go to a movie is I, I like to observe what I call the exiting theater phenomenon. And by that I mean I like to get there early and I like to watch the audience who's coming out of the show just before the one I went to. And I like to look at their body language. I like to look at and, and see are they smiling, are they laughing, are they serious, what are they, what's happening. And you should do the same thing. When you're creating a presentation, you should explicitly think about what type of reaction is it that you want your audience to have when you are when they're exiting your presentation do you want them to be happy sad do you want them to be serious do you want them to be resolved what is it that you want them to walk away with that's really really important and a lot of times presenters really don't even think about this they just think well I gotta impart some information let me get it to them let me give it to them as quickly as I can and uh, uh, in a few slides and, and let me uh, go on my way. But I really want you to think about wh what you want your audience to be doing when they uh, leave. What kind of nonverbal communication do you see with them? Um, how do we as presenters reinforce the learning experience so that the learning experience becomes tangible? And this is really a very easy thing to do in PowerPoint because PowerPoint is such a graphically oriented uh, program and it's really a lot of fun to use. Um, audiences general, generally really enjoy PowerPoint presentations if they are designed correctly. 
it's important once you as the speaker have identified what that takeaway is going to be. It, it, it's, mo it's important for you to verbally state it to, to yourself at a minimum, uh, to perhaps some colleagues who are helping you create your presentation, and it's important to state it to the audience. What is it that you want them to take away? So for example, in today's presentation, I want you all to take away the concept that there is a new approach to creating a PowerPoint presentation. I want you to walk away with the concept that maybe less is more, that an uncluttered presentation is better than a cluttered one, that a streamlined presentation is more effective. I'm thinking about that, and I'm thinking, what is it that I, I want you, I want the audience to whistle the tune. When you're leaving that theater, I want to see if the audience is, is whistling the tune, and, and that's what I'm hoping that we're able to do today. All right, let's first talk about presentation length. And again, all of us have been subjected to many PowerPoint presentations that go on ad infinitum, it seems like, and, and it becomes an effort to, to even stay awake during some of them. One rule of thumb, and that's all these are, rules of thumb that I've seen over the years, is that it's important when you're creating a PowerPoint presentation to change the slides about every three minutes. Any faster than that, makes the users overwhelmed with the amount of information that you're presenting. Any, any uh, longer than about three minutes and the users get bored. They're looking at the same imagery, unless the imagery is really complicated and then, and then that can create another problem. But generally when you're creating a presentation, you want to be able to change those slides, uh, move from one slide to another about every three minutes. It might be faster, it might be slower, but about of that. So what does that mean? Well, if I've got a 30-minute presentation and I've got three minutes per slide, that means I've only got 10 slides and that is not a heck of a lot of information. Most people think, oh my goodness, if I've got to make a 30-minute presentation, I must have to have 30 or 40 slides. No, you don't. You have to be able to understand what the audience can digest. Some audiences might be able to digest more technical information, some audiences may be less, but in general, if we have a 30-minute presentation that we're making at three minutes per slide, we're going to have only 10 slides, and when I think about those 10 slides, I say, uh-oh, I've got to count my introduction slide, who I am, and I've got to count any kind of question and answer slide, so guess what, now I'm left with only eight content slides in a 30-minute presentation, and there's only one response that I can think of to that. And that's yikes. How am I possibly going to tell the story in eight slides for a 30-minute presentation? But if you think about the math, I ought to be able to do it, okay? Well, that leads directly into the whole issue of slide complexity. And this is really a very, very difficult concept, but it's something that I think uh, we've all, again, suffered from. Perhaps we've, we've inflicted it upon others. I know I have. Um, but we really want to make sure that we do pay attention to so slide complexity. I have found that once we get above about 40 words on a slide, users, again, begin not to really process everything because we're throwing so much information at them, especially if we're only taking three minutes per slide. Once you get to 40, more than 40 words in a slide, and, and in fact, I, I like to keep it to about 30, between 25 and 30 words when I can, but I would say no more than about 40 words per slide, what happens is there's too much information to be read or di digested, and the, the font will be so small that people in the back of the room or even maybe the middle of the room won't be able to read that, that slide. So no more than 40 words per slide. And using consistent font styles, and I always say that a maximum of no more than two different font size styles, that would be two, I, I could probably say that a little bit better, two different, one font style and no more than two sizes in any, any particular um, presentation I have found to help to reduce the amount of slide complexity and increase the amount of um, the, the, the digestibility, shall we say, of your slide. Animation. Many people use animation and some people just use it as a gimmick, as a toy, as a way of preventing the audience from falling asleep. But 
a lot of people use animation. They overuse animation, um, whether it's drop downs or it's, it's the way uh, uh, information flows or uh, the use of graphics or the use of cartoons or what have you. So you really have to think about using animation and using, using it effectively. And again, it comes back to the whole issue of the audience takeaway. What do I want this audience to wa walk away from? I have found it a great idea to rehearse the slides with colleagues whenever you're able to. That really provides the ability to get some good feedback um, and from people who both are inside of the HIM world and external to the HIM world. Even if you're presenting to technical material to people who you think should understand the technical nuances of it, frequently they don't. And it's important to rehearse the slides with your colleagues, to show them the, the slides and see what kind of questions uh, they have or to get their feedback as to whether something is, is uh, comprehensible or not. So again, it comes back to using the right tool for the right job. Well, what does that mean? And it, it means understanding that software has different functions. And they, every piece of software doesn't operate in the same way. Um, Word is is expert at at uh, manipulating text. Excel for charts and graphics. Microsoft Access for database. Um, and, and to when we're using data from a different environment, be it Word, Excel, or Access, or any other environment, to, to save that data in the original format that Microsoft intended it to, and then to pull it in dynamically from Word or Excel or Access or whatever other software program you might be using. So it really does come to using the right tool for the job. And and then when we link data from a spreadsheet to a PowerPoint presentation or from a, a Word document to a PowerPoint presentation, to use what we call, to, to, to do this linking using what's called object-oriented linking. And we're going to be using the paste special command. We're not going to have a lot of commands today. You're not going to have to digest a lot of those words, uh, those commands. But there will be uh, a few uh, in, uh, the commands that, that we'll be talking about. So I think that if you use the right tool for the right job and, you, and use the tools that are meant to be used for a particular function, I think that will go a long way. Now, when we talk about integrating <laughs> information into PowerPoint with Word, we have to really carefully evaluate all existing documents for the content. And we have to, ex we have to exert some of those same issues that we had, or that I talked about a little bit earlier. Are things too complex? Are they too busy? What's my word count? Those are the types of things we really do need to pay attention to. And we need to really pare down to simplify the existing documents as much as we can so that when we bring that, that data from Word into PowerPoint. It's as simple and it's as clear as possible. This next point, bullet point, is really an important one. To concentrate on content, not appearance. And I know I can hear people rumbling out there saying, oh no, it's very important to worry about the appearance. And I would not disagree with that. But when you are creating your PowerPoint presentation in the beginning, the content is much more important than the appearance. And I'll demonstrate that in a, in a few minutes when we start, actually, when I go into PowerPoint and start uh, working with, with it directly. You'll, you'll see exactly what I mean, that we need to concentrate on the content and not the appearance. There'll be time at the end to make to, to, to make the appearance look really, really nice. One of the things that we need to do when we're working with Microsoft Word is to create links. And that is to say, I don't simply want to copy and paste from Word into PowerPoint, but I want to create a dynamic link so that if something changes on the Word side in my Word document, it will dynamically update my information in Microsoft PowerPoint. And the other thing that I've noticed over the time has been that using Microsoft Word with a text box, if I have data that I want to bring into PowerPoint, it helps if that data in Word is enclosed within a text box so that when you bring the text over from Word, you can then manipulate its size and, and its display easily in PowerPoint. You'll see what I mean when I'm, I'm working with this. When we're talking about integrating PowerPoint with Excel, 
I'm a big believer in saying create your charts in Excel and then bring those charts into PowerPoint rather than the other way around. I know a lot of people like to create the, their charts in PowerPoint and then have everything in, in the native area of PowerPoint, but I have found it, it much, it's much easier to create those charts in Excel, to manipulate the data in Excel, to make it look really, really nice in Excel because Excel gives you so many good, solid graphics tools to work with when we're talking about charts and then bring that data into Excel. All right, also creating, to avoid creating overly complex charts, we've spoken about this before, again, I'm sure all of you know this, um, to clearly mark titles and axes. This is really, really important because even though you may be familiar, completely familiar with the data, your users may not be, and to always document the data source. And I have found using data labels um, to be a good reference point in creating information, um, integrating Excel with Power point and then finally using that paste special linking tool which I will be demonstrating in a few minutes finally talking about linking information between access and PowerPoint and that's a bit trickier I'll show you how to do it in, in a little bit um, but it is, it is a little bit uh, trickier the, the links between access and PowerPoint take a little bit more technical savvy uh, but but they're not terribly difficult but they they are certainly a more complex complicated than while working with um, uh, Excel or Word. It's important if you are bringing data over from Access that you understand the difference between tables and queries. I mean, if you need to brush up on that, I would encourage you to do so. Um, it, when you bring the data over from uh, Access to PowerPoint, uh, the, the uh, PowerPoint may ask some questions about whether it's a table or a query, and, and if you don't really understand that that data is, is, is held in a table and it's, and it's selected in a query, that can be problematic. Um, Bringing data over uh, from uh, charts, so you can bring a chart over from Access into Excel, and um, and you or you can you can bring it from Access to Excel and then create a nice chart in Excel and then bring it over into PowerPoint. Um, but that can get a little bit cumbersome, so uh, that, that that's something to be uh, to, to to think about and and to not not get too caught up in um, if it gets too difficult. I'll show you how to deal with this in a few moments. The big thing that, that separates Microsoft Access from PowerPoint is the classical one-to-many relationship between um, a, in, a, in, a, in a true relational database, one patient, many encounters, um, one employee, many paychecks, and so forth. And, that's the, and, and when we have complicated data sets in Access, sometimes they can be a little bit more difficult to bring over in Access, uh, in, into PowerPoint. Um, and one last thing to avoid looking at um, and, and show, uh, showing any lookup tables that are used in Access. That can make your, uh, uh, your, your relationship between PowerPoint and Access uh, a little bit more difficult. So what we're going to be doing, what I'm going to be demonstrating now is going to be what we call putting the pieces together. We're going to start with PowerPoint and I'm going to show you how we're going to take information from Word, from Excel, from Access, and from the web. We're going to take all of this information and then we're going to take them, bring information into PowerPoint from these different platforms and then uh, hopefully what's going to happen is we're going to be able to have a nice presentation that allows us to import text from Word to be able to uh, link charts from Excel to create a pivot table and access and then to link that access file into PowerPoint, and then to bring data over from the internet. That's what we're trying to do. Now you can see from this graphic here that it's rather compl complicated. So I'm going to spend really about the next uh, 50 minutes or so playing out the reality of how we do this. I'm going to go in a very straightforward manner. I'm going to uh, demonstrate each one of these linkages, and hopefully you'll be able to uh, follow along and understand what we're, what we're doing. So at the when we're all done, we'll have a time for questions and answers. You're welcome as we go, uh, as I go through this, to submit any uh, email, uh, any questions, um, and and we'll we'll take a look at them. If you uh, don't get to the questions today, you can um, submit them uh, to me uh, tomorrow or later on today, um, and, uh, and and I'll be happy to answer them as best I can. So now I'm going to uh, go out of PowerPoint 
and excuse me, go out of our presentation software, and I'm going to go into um, a, a, pre a presentation here. And let's begin at the beginning. Uh, let's suppose I wanted to create a presentation, and I'm going to call this presentation. Oh, hold on, I'm not sure. Hold, hold on one second. Ah, thank you. Okay, and there we go. And I'm going to take and I'm going to create this, this presentation. You're going to actually see me working in PowerPoint, and I'm going to um, create a presentation um, from scratch. Let's suppose we had uh, a. I've, I've already cre pre-created my my titles here, and I'm going to we're going to create a a, um, a presentation having to do with, with cardiac surgery. Actually, let me start something from scratch. What I want to do is let me. Uh, go here and let's suppose I say I want to create a blank presentation and I'm going to create a presentation that addresses a number of different um, problems that might be associated with an HIM department. Um, let's suppose I was doing an annual report, annual report for the HIM department. And I might put the date down here. The date is going to be um, November 19th, 2013. And you'll notice that as I go through creating my annual report here, over on the left side of my screen, I hope you're all able to see this, you're able to see, you can see two tabs here. And the two tabs say slides and outline. Most of us are very familiar with the slide section. So if I wanted to add a new slide, I can go click on a new slide. I can go in and I can grab one of the templates that's physical that's that's here. Let's suppose I go in and I'm, I'm going to grab my template that's got title and content, and then I would uh, put for my next slide title goes here, and I'm going to create he, over here point one point two. Point three and so forth. And I'm going to create a, a simple presentation right here. And you'll notice that as I create my presentation, I'm building a series of slides here. If I want to put in a new slide here, I can then go down. I'll create another slide here. Another slide goes here. And I'll add uh, additional points. Additional point. Adi Oops, sorry about that. Additional point and so forth. And so now I've got a nice little presentation. I'm going to click slideshow and I can say I've got my presentation and I've created it very simply. You'll notice that over here on the left side of the screen it's building my series of slides. But what most people don't really work with too much is this outline right here. And look what happens when you go to this outline over here it actually creates a, a physical outline of my information that I've got in my slide. And so what I tell people usually when they're creating a new presentation is to forget about the slides. Don't even worry about the slides because people tend to get very hung up on what does it look like? Do I have the right fonts? Do I have the right location? Is They, they get really worried about the, 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 the look of the slides. What I do is I tell people, Worry about the outline. Create your thoughts in the outline, and then once you've got your your thoughts in the outline, then you're going to go in and you're going to say, okay, how can I take that information and bring it into PowerPoint? Well, I'm going to show you. Let's create a new one. Okay, I'm going to create a new presentation. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out to Microsoft Word. I'm going to go out. Whoops. And I'm, I'm going to go to a file that I've created. We're going to be doing one of my favorite topics. We're going to be doing a, uh, a we're, we're going, hold on one moment. How can I get rid of, oh, yeah, let me close that. Sorry about that. Okay. And, and let's suppose I have my uh, discharge not final bill reduction project. Let's suppose I've 
created information. I've, I've got this presentation, and I've got my team members, and I've got our faithful boss here, Ellen, is going to be our director of HIM, and here are the different people. I'm going to be uh, at the data analyst. Paul Rousseau is going to be the coding supervisor, and our colleague here in the control booth, Darian, is going to be the coder. So let's suppose we were doing a DINFIB uh, reduction project. Here are our team members and here are the, our reduction strategies. And let's suppose I've already got this information already in Microsoft Word. Well, why rebuild the wheel? Let me just simply take what I've got here in Microsoft Word and bring it over into Microsoft PowerPoint. So I'm going to begin by bringing over my title and now I'm going to go over to my presentation and I've got my, uh, I can get rid of the, the PowerPoint, the title that I've got up there, and I can, whoops. So you see I've brought that information over directly from my PowerPoint presentation, and you can see that it's over here. I've already created it here. It's appearing on my outline, okay? So now I'm going to go in and I'm going to add a new slide. I'm going to put in a, uh, a, uh, a title slide here, and now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint, pres excuse me, I'm going to go back to my Word document, I'm going to take my team members, I'm going to copy them, and now I'm going to go over to my outline. There I've got them. Of course, I've got to I've got to play a, a, around a bit with this. I've got to make it look a little a little bit uh, nicer. But I, I I can take each one of these items and I can take take them and bring them over as part of my my PowerPoint presentation. If I go and add a new slide, I'm going to go here. Oops, excuse me. Let me get rid of that, and I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. I'm I'm going to bring in my text box here. I'm going to just simply copy it out of Word. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to paste it. And now when I've pasted it, I've got it over here in PowerPoint. I can see it, but more importantly, I've pasted it as a text box and, whoops, hold on one moment. Go back to PowerPoint. I'm going to bring it over here and then I'm going to bring it over into PowerPoint. I'm going to paste it, and then I'm going to bring it down. I'm going to play around with the size, make it larger. I'm going to change my fonts. The point that I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that what you can do with information is you can start with the, the data in PowerPoint, excuse me, in Word. You can then take that information in, Power, in, in Word, bring it over into PowerPoint, and you can create a dynamic relationship between my Word file that you see here and my PowerPoint presentation that you see here. And all the while, what I'm doing is I'm not worrying about my slides. What I'm worrying about is what my data looks like in my PowerPoint presentation. Let me bring over my team members again. I'm going to bring this information over here because I didn't like the way it looked there. I'm going to type in here team, team members. And I'm going to bring the information over. I can move my slides around. I can move my data up and down. I can make it look nicer. Of course, we, we can do all sorts of things to make to make this uh, to make our our uh, margins look a little bit prettier and so forth. But you get the idea. What I'm able to do is I'm able to take the information from Word, bring it directly over into PowerPoint dynamically and not worry so much about do I have everything that I need. If I've already got my team members listed in a Microsoft Word document, why am I going through the, the trouble of retyping all that information when I uh, bring it into PowerPoint? And I can do the same thing all the way. So one of the things that I like to do is I like to tell individuals, I like to recommend to, to individuals that when creating a PowerPoint presentation from scratch that you th while you, while the slides may be helpful think about using this outline and think about using it in such a way that enables you to just sketch out your thoughts let me give you another example of how you can use that outline 
frequently when you're creating an outline, you're really not quite sure exactly what you want to do. So if I say, well, I've got a 20-minute presentation, I know I'm going to put in uh, my first slide is going to be title goes here. My second uh, uh, th it, my second slide is going to be um, team members go here. My third si slide is going to be project uh, objective goes here. And then I can go in step one, step two, step three. My summary uh, is going to go here. Uh, my recommendations are going to go here. And my questions and answers are going to go here. And so what I've done, ladies and gentlemen, is I've created, using this outline, a very, very quick way of, of sort of collecting my thoughts and, and saying, how do I want to structure what I've done? I'm not worrying about the presentation. If I now go to slides, you can now see that I've got the outline of a slideshow right here. And I've done, I've, got, I've sort of given myself the, the, the ability to put it in a structural fashion. And now, now that I've got my thoughts collected, I can begin going through and saying, um, exactly what I'm going to put. I can put the details in. One of the big advantages of working with the outline is that you can bring information in directly from Word. So if you've already sketched out your thoughts in Word, you can just simply bring the data in in Word. Once you've got it in Word, then you can start moving it around, you can start working with it, and you can start actually playing with some of the concepts. And then once you've got it all done in an outline form, then go in and start playing around with the slides and, and creating graphics and creating all the different things that are nice. So that's just one little kind of way that I've found using a PowerPoint to be really um, uh, helpful. So now let's take a, a, a live example. Let's go into an example that I've created um, using uh, that topic that I told, talked about earlier, uh, the DINFIB. Okay, let's go into, um, we're going to create a, uh, a presentation called the uh, CUNY HIM Medical Center, and we're going to, our project is known as the DINFIB uh, analysis that we're going to be doing here. I've already set this up. I've got my date here. And now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and I'm going to f find out what my reason is. Why, why is it that we're going to be doing a DINFIB uh, analysis? So, and so I would summarize here what, uh, whatever that happens to be. Well, maybe I've already written that out uh, s somewhere. Maybe I've, I've created that over in my uh, area in my uh, Word document. Um, I can see that I haven't, so I'm going to create right over here a, uh, a, a, a charge. I'm going to say um, objective reduce number of accounts and overall value of these accounts on the DNFB report. I've got that information right here. I'm going to bring it over. I copy it. I bring it over to my DINFIB analysis and I paste it. I've, I can now manipulate it, I can do with it whatever I want to do with it, and so forth. I can change my fonts, I can uh, make it, you know, whatever I wanted to do with it, I can make it as pretty as I want. Let's suppose I say, well, you know, I also want to be able to introduce into this, this DINFIB analysis, in addition to my, the names of my uh, mem uh, the team members or what have you, I also want to introduce some graphical information. Well, let's begin by looking at some information that I've already put together in a spreadsheet. Okay, and let's begin by looking at this Excel spreadsheet for a moment. Okay, we're sort of jumping into the world of Excel here. So here I've got my patient name, the medical record number, so on and so forth. And I've indicated here, let me make this a little bit larger so that everybody can see it a little bit better. 
Okay, you can see that I've I've got several different reasons for why a patient may have ended up on the DINFIB list, whether it's a coding issue or an appeal or some documentation is lacking or there's a late charge issue or something got held up in transcription. So I've got a whole list of individuals on this particular uh, spreadsheet. What have we got? We've got about 40 lines of data. So yeah, 40 exactly 40 patients on this particular DINFIB list. I can make this a little bit smaller pull that up a little bit and I can see my total charges. So now in Excel, I'm sort of putting my PowerPoint on back on the back burner for a moment and I'm saying, well, what can I do in Excel to analyze this data? Well, obviously I can create a pivot table. Um, well, take a look at this. One of the key things that I've got here in the spreadsheet is I've, I'm doing a calculation based upon how many days post discharge each particular patient's record is. And look at the formula I'm using. I'm using a formula, I hope you can see this, it says up here equals today open paren close paren minus H2. So this is a dynamic calculation. Every day this calculation, column I, is going to get recalculated. So I can tell that Ellen Carter's record number 345678 and the amount of 62,400, she's got Blue Cross, her account is held up in DINFIB for a coding issue. She was discharged 34 days ago. The problem with all of this data here, all of this continuous data, is that it's going to become very, very unwieldy when I try to graph that. Nobody really wants to look at a graph that's got 34 different data points, or 33 or 32, or however many data points this would have if I were to graph all this information. So what I do is I use my powers of deductive reasoning and I say let's collapse all of these th these data points into several categories and look what I'm doing here in column J what I'm doing is I'm saying give me based upon column I give me a categorical a, a category associated with each one of these data points. So if the data is as, as it is for this record at 34 days, we're going to put this record in the 31 to 40 category. This patient goes in the 21 to 30 category. This patient goes into the 11, the, the 11 to 20 category. How am I doing that? I'm using my friend back in uh, Excel, the if statement. And the if statement is listed up here. We will be happy to distribute this to any of you that might be wondering how I did this. But the if statements are very, even though this looks complicated, it is not complicated at all. It's just a matter of opening and closing parentheses and getting your commas in the correct way, in the correct location. So now, for example, if I were to say, oops, we've got the wrong date here. Uh, uh, Ellen Carter was not discharged on, um, on October 16th. She was discharged on uh, October uh, 1st. It will automatically change the number of days that she's in DINFIB to 49, and it puts her in that category of 40 plus. So you get the idea that what, what I'm doing here. So now, now that I've got all my data, my DINFIB data is all here, I'm now going to do a pivot table, and that pivot table is going to give me the following results. I go to my reasons summary. I've already created this pivot table. I'll be happy to show anybody how to do that if you aren't already familiar with how to do that. And what I'm doing here is, I'm making that a little bit bigger so that you can see it. I hope it's not bleeding off the edge of your screen. What I've done is I've summarized all the different accounts. So I know I've got 10 accounts that are being held for appeal, 11 accounts for coding, and so on and so forth. And I've expressed that information right here. So now, and this is the real power of what we're doing. We want to take this data here from Excel and we want to bring it into our PowerPoint presentation. Well, I could do a copy and paste, but what I really want to do is I want to link it. I want to take this data so that if something changes back here, it will update my, my uh, folder here and it will then update my uh, PowerPoint presentation. So take a look at this. What I'm doing here is I'm going to go in and I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to then, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to single click on my graphic here. I'm going to right click and I'm going to click on left click on where it says copy. So I'm now copying this content, this graph. I'm going to then go over to my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to change the name here. Uh, 
reason, reason summary, and I'm going to click, I'm going to do a right click, and now this is where it gets really interesting. You see down here, paste option, this, this option here, it says keep source formatting and link that I click that and look what it does. It brings my full. It, it, it brings my data over from Power, from Excel into PowerPoint. Okay, and now if I go back to Power, if I go back to Excel. Sorry about that. And let's add a few more, more to the appeals. Notice I've got ten appeals here. So we're going to go over here and I'm going to change a bunch of these to appeal, 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 okay? I'm going to make a whole bunch of these appeals, and look what happens here. I now go over here, and I'm going to refresh my data, and uh, refresh all, and so now, look what happened. My appeals have gone up to 21. You can see it reflected here, and now if I go back to my DINFIB analysis here, it's now dynamically reflected in my PowerPoint presentation. I'm in PowerPoint here, I'm in Excel here, I've changed one thing here, I changed a few of those appeals, let's add a few uh, coding issues, I'm going to say coding, 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 boy we've got a real problem with our coders. Okay, I'm going to go back, again I'm in Excel, I go here, I'm going to go, I'm in my, my pivot table, watch what happens to this number 9. I click on refresh all, that 9 now becomes a 19, it gets reflected in my graphic that I did in Excel, and now I'm going to go over to my DINFIB analysis, and it's automatically getting reflected there. This, ladies and gentlemen, is really the power behind creating a linkage between Excel and PowerPoint. What I'm doing is I'm able to take the information from Excel, create my pivot table, create my graphic in Excel. I've stayed in Excel the entire time. Then when I've got it looking like I want it to look in Excel, I then bring it over, but I don't just copy it. If I were just to copy it, that would bring it over as a picture, I would plop it in there, I'd have no linkage. What I've done here instead is I've brought it over, I've brought this graphic that I've got in Excel, I brought that graphic over and I brought it over to PowerPoint and I linked it dynamically. So now if I do my slideshow and I do my beginning, and I've got a dynamic linkage between PowerPoint and Excel. This is really exciting and, it, and, and what it does is it can save you hours and hours of time, particularly in situations where you are trying to uh, work with lots of different data that may have come from previous reports or perhaps the, 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 the data is coming from uh, somebody else's uh, work and so you might have uh, individuals that are feeding uh, the information to you centrally and then you need to link it. What this does is it really helps to improve uh, your ability to pull that, the, the data from different locations. It's really great. Let me do this again. Let's suppose I say, well, I really want to look at my information, why something is on the DINFIB list, and I want to look at it by the number of days that something is being held, but I don't want to just look at the days. I, will, I want to look at the dollars associated with those accounts. So I'm going to go back to my Excel data, and I go over to my DINFIB list. I see all the different reasons. I go to my reason by days, and I see where the information is now uh, there. If I want to now um, refresh my data, I can refresh it, and it will now reflect that information there. I can now take this information that I've recreated my, uh, my, my distribution of data in, my, in Excel, and I'm going to right-click, copy. I'm going to now go back to PowerPoint, I'm going to right click, and I'm going to use this third option here that says keep source formatting and link my data. If I click on that, it will bring the data over. Once I've got it in PowerPoint, I can then manipulate the size, I can make it look pretty, I can change the colors, I can do whatever I want to do. I can do that easily within PowerPoint, but I like to, I like the, the preservation 
integration of my analysis in Excel and then do all my, my number crunching in Excel and make that the, the data in Excel respond to my PowerPoint presentation. That's really uh, how I have found it to be useful. Once I've got my information in PowerPoint, I can then go in, I can create my my slideshow, I can do what, whatever I would like to do, um, I can present it, and, and it makes it much easier to work with. So I, I guess the, the, the uh, issue that I'm trying to express is that I think it comes back to using the proper tool for the proper job. In this case, I'm using Excel for doing my data, my number crunching. I'm doing using PowerPoint for doing my presentation of the data. Um, again, very exciting. It's very uh, easy to do this. It's pretty much a copy and paste. Um, or, but you you have to remember that when you do your copy. Oops, excuse me. You want to right click and you don't want to just simply paste. That would be the control V, but you want to do your you want to use this keep source formatting and link to uh, to the location. And what that actually does, ladies and gentlemen, is behind the scenes, it creates a linkage between your PowerPoint presentation and your Excel spreadsheet so that if anything changes here in your Excel spreadsheet, it will automatically change in your PowerPoint presentation. So this is a really powerful tool. Uh, let me now show you how Mike. You, Hi, yes, Mike. Yes. Yes. Hi, Ed, Ellen. I have a question from the audience. Um, so what about the access titles when using dynamic lin links and pivot tables? Do you insert them in the PowerPoint? That's really a kind of a philosophical uh, question. Um, you can do it in either location. Uh, the title, I, I come back to uh, the issue that I, I genuinely, generally like to get all my data points all set up here in, in Excel. And then when I go into PowerPoint, I'll probably dress it up a little bit. But I like to make sure that, 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 that there's a high correlation between what I've got here in Excel and what I've got going on here in in in, um, in PowerPoint, uh, but I like my data to be as pure as I can, which is why I, I tend to uh, take care of the data in Excel and then kind of the the dressing it up uh, in in PowerPoint. Again, that is only my approach. Uh, there, you could certainly make a case for doing it in a different way. Okay, I hope that answered that question. If it didn't, please shoot me an email and I will be happy to uh, address that offline. Okay, uh, let me catch my breath here, boy. Let's now talk a little bit about pulling information from Microsoft Access into PowerPoint. I'm gonna close this and I'm gonna say don't save this. I'm gonna not save that. Um, and let's suppose I wanna pull information um, into into uh, PowerPoint from Microsoft Access. Well, let me pull up something here. Let me close that. Um, close my Word document. I am now going to go in, and we're very lucky in in New York State. We have this. We have what's known as okay. Thank you. Okay, we have a uh, a very robust. A database in Microsoft uh, in, in, in that the State Department of Health um, maintains that addresses the use of cardio arterial bypass surgery um, in the cabbage uh, studies. It goes back, it's a, it's a massive data collection effort that the Department of Health uh, has run for many years and they publish data that's available to hospitals and to uh, the public in, uh, in Excel format, access format, PDF format, and so forth. So what I've done is I've created some information in, um, I, I pulled down some, some data from Microsoft Access. And this is publicly available data, so don't get nervous if you see uh, you know the names of hospitals here and so forth this is all data that you could access easily on the on the web and this happens to be some information having to do with uh, the number of deaths and the ob observed mortality rate and expected mortality rate for an open heart risk project that the 
the New York State Department of Health uh, runs. And what I've done here is I've, I've taken the data, I've just pulled it over, raw data, I believe this is for the years 2008 through, through 2010 for each one of the hospitals. So just as one data point here, I can see that Lenox Hill Hospital, which isn't very far from where I speak right now, uh, during that time period had 2,740 cases, 13 um, operative deaths for an observed mortality rate of 0.47%. And based upon the um, uh, expected model that the state uses, they would have expected an observed mortality of about uh, 0.57. So Lenox Hill did a little bit better than they would have thought, uh, than, than the, the model would have predicted. Well, what I've done here is I said, okay, well, since, I, since it's going to be problematic to, to graph every one of these individual data points, Let's look at the data in cohorts. And what I've done is I've simply taken the information and I've said, let's pull the data on the basis of whether the, uh, the, the uh, individual came from the upstate region, uh, which is really the northern counties, whether they're from one of the five boroughs of New York State. City and whether they are um, a um, or, or they are from the, one of the downstate counties uh, closer to New York, usually Rockland, Westchester County, and those sort of sorts. So what I'm doing is I'm basically categorizing every one of the hospitals because I want to look at the data and I want to be able to draw some conclusions. One of the other things that I, I want to be able to do is I want to look at it and I want to say, well, let's look at this distribution of data here. And if I and if I look at this data, I see that a number of hospitals had small volume, 19 cases there, 114 cases there, and other hospitals had huge, enormous volume. So we're going to divide the, these hospitals into the low volume hospitals and the high volume. Why? Because I thought that would be a, an easy way of looking at the data. So what I do is in access, I create um, a, a, uh, a hospital, I create a query, and notice what I've done here. I've said if the uh, hospital's volume is over 500, let's give it the label high volume. If it's under 500, we're going to call it a low volume hospital. Th these are completely arbitrary. I'm just playing around with the data here. Okay. So what that does is it enables me to create a report. I can create actually the the equivalent of a pivot table. If you remember pivot tables from, from Excel, uh, Access has a, a pivot table. They call it a, a query. They, they call it a, a, a cross tab query. I click there and I can see this distribution of information. Okay. And hold on, we have a little bit of a technical problem. Okay, and if I want to look at the information by region and by volume, I can close my query, and I can click on where I have my my cabbage procedures, and I I've got a, a report here that enables me to look at the region, and I can see among my low volume hospitals in the downstate area, we had 114 cases. And, and 1320 of the high volume for a total of 1434 cases for this time period. Here's just simply a distribution. And I can also create in access, I can create a little graph that shows this information. So now, how do I take this information and bring it over into PowerPoint? Well, that's easily enough done. If I if I, but although it's not as easy as it was in Excel, what I have to do is I actually have to click on the design view of my graph here, and I right click, and I'm going to take the chart and I'm going to click on, I'm going to click on it, and I'm going to click on open, and this brings me in to a, a software program which you, you probably have loaded on your computer, although you may not be aware of it, and it's called Microsoft graph and what Microsoft graph does is it serves as sort of an intermediary between Microsoft X access and Microsoft PowerPoint so I'm going to I've got my graph here I'm going to click on edit and I'm going to copy the chart here then I'm going to go to my PowerPoint presentation which is I've called it cabbage analysis here and we're going to click on here and I'm going to right click and I'm going to do my paste option like I did before. It's exactly the same operation that I did and I've now got a linkage between my PowerPoint presentation here and my access database. And to prove it, let's do this. Let's close out of, out of my graphic. I'm in 
access here. I'm going to go back to my original table. I'm going to close my table here in PowerPoint in access. I'm going to go over here and I'm going to take Albany Medical Center. I'm going to give them a ridiculous number. I'm going to say they did, they're an upstate hospital, they did 10,000 cases. I'm going to take that information. I'm going to now recreate my volume. Look what it did. It took my volume that was much smaller before and it, it shot it way up here, up to nearly 15,000 cases. I'm going to close that. I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to copy my object. I'm going to open it up, edit, copy the chart. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation and I'm going to do my linkage. And you can see that I've, uh, did it do it? No, it didn't do it. We've got a problem there. Okay. Um, hold on, let me go back to my, my PowerPoint presentation here. Okay. Chart object. I'm going to open that. Edit. I'm going to copy. Oh, hold on, that's not updated. Let me close that. My apologies. Okay, like that. Okay, uh, pardon me for the little, we had a little technical issue there with the computer size, the, the screen size. Okay, let me now redo my chart. I've got my upstate numbers have increased. I'm going to now go to my volume. I'm go going to now design that. I'm going to take that and I'm going to open that and we're going to take this chart here, edit, copy chart. I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to do, I'm going to paste and I've now got, oops, sorry about that. And now my data from my power, my access table has, my access database has now updated my PowerPoint presentation. So I can now do slideshow from the beginning and I've got my data dynamically linked between PowerPoint and Microsoft Access. So hopefully this has shown you a little bit about the linkages that you can create. In the time that we have left, I want to show you two other little tools, little tricks and tips that you can use for making your life in PowerPoint a little bit easier, a lot easier. The first thing that I want to show you is something that a lot of people don't even really pay much attention to at all. Let me go into PowerPoint here. Actually, I need to open up a new document. If I click on File, New, and when I click on File, New, take a look at these. You undoubtedly have this as well, or something that looks very similar to this. Do you see where it says sample templates? Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, has created a whole bunch of very, very useful templates that people can use, that, that people in HIM can use for a lot of different things. And you'll notice something about these templates when I go into that, the first one that I'm going to show you. Um, it, it, it basically creates an entire presentation for you and then you can take that presentation and manipulate it and make it into your own. So I'm going to click on sample templates and notice I've got one here called training. I'm going to click on that one and watch what happens. I'm going to click create training and and it gives me this little template here about training new employees. And it looks very nice. It's got that wave icon. And if I do my slideshow, I can see that I've got a very nice icon here. I've got an, some nice uh, transitions from one to the next. It can be a, a, a very nice slide. But take a look at what's behind the scenes, ladies and gentlemen. Notice here, we've got our slides. But over here, isn't this great? Look at this outline. We've got an outline here. So I can take this and make this my own. Look how quickly we can do this. Training new employees of CUNY Medical Center. Okay, and I'm going to say presenter Michael Guerra 
presentation date, November 19th, 2013. And look what it does. It gives me here in an outline, what are we going to be doing for new employee orientation? Getting to know your new assignment, familiarizing yourself with uh, your new environment, meeting your colleagues. Let's suppose, since this is a healthcare presentation, I want to have uh, importance of HIPAA. Um, location of cafeteria, um, payroll policies and procedures. And what you can do is you can very easily, using this outline right here, you can create a very nice presentation in just a few minutes. If you don't like the, 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 the graphics that they've uh, given you, you can easily uh, take, a, take on different um, graphics. There are a lot of different things you can do. So what I would encourage you to do is, I'm not going to save that, but what I would encourage you to do is to go to PowerPoint and click on File, New, and then go to where it says um, the uh, sample templates, and there are a lot of different templates that are available to you. They also give you a whole bunch of temp different types of templates down here. I like this one, where you go to presentations, and there are some great presentations that Microsoft will give you that have to do with uh, demonstrating products. Um, Here are a whole series of medical and healthcare presentations. Um, many of my clients have used these. Um, having to do with nutrition and uh, medic, uh, patient education and so forth. Let's take a look at, at this one. Okay, and we've got a patient hum uh, humongous insurance patient health education seminar. And look what it, it, it's so rich in functionality. And you can go right to here and then you can begin and, and ch change it into whatever you want it to be. Uh, I think they use probably a few too many words in this one, but that's just my own opinion. And so I would encourage you to, to, get, to take a look at some of these again, to get their file new go to the, these various types of templates that you see here, the sample templates. They have um, a, a whole series of, of uh, presentations that are, that are really great, uh, very useful. They have a number of different um, pro, uh, project templates. That one isn't loaded. I thought that was. Um, so what I would do is I would encourage you to take a look at some of those presentation templates that are out there by clicking File, new and then going in and finding which ones might be uh, templates that would be useful to you. This one I, I have used on a number of occasions, the project status report. And again, I jump right to outline. I don't even worry about the slides. I go to the outline. This basically leads you through you know, uh, the, the project. What, it's, what is it about? What are the goals? What's the Scope. If there's a, um, a a timeline associated with it, you can easily go in and manipulate that. I can say, okay, uh, milestone one is going to be uh, January 1st, 2014. This puts me in in mind of uh, that the looming deadline of um, of uh, ICD-10. Uh, this is going to be uh, April 1st, 2014. Um, let's go to uh, July 1st, 2014, and then there's that fun date that we're all looking forward to this time, about, about this time next year, October 14, and I, I don't know why it's not letting me manipulate this, but we'll leave it. But anyway, the point that I'm trying to make, ladies and gentlemen, is that you can go here, uh, here, I can, I can type my text here. I'm going to put in October 1st, 2014. And you can go to this, the outline area and you can really create whatever you'd like. If you don't want a particular tem uh, uh, template, uh, you can just simply delete that slide. It will get rid of it. it the, these are absolutely wonderful and they're underutilized. So, you know, just in sort of a summary before we go into our question and answer uh, session, um, the, there are a lot of different ways of working with PowerPoint. Um, I encourage you to really explore this online uh, aspect of using it because the, uh, the uh, not, I'm sorry, not the online, the outline uh, section of it because
because this can really help you to strengthen uh, your, your your analytical thoughts as to how you put together a presentation. Don't worry about the slides, what they're going to look like. Once you're all done, and then you can start working on the slide, and and that's that's easily enough done. If I uh, pull up my uh, my DINFIB analysis, I've, I've done it here, and I've got a nice presentation here. I do it from the beginning, and I have got I've got my team members, my reduction strategies, data that you've already seen, and if I don't like what that looks like, I can simply go to the design and I can change my design here I can cho choose one of the themes up here if I say okay let me show it look at it this way and then I can using that one and it will make all those decisions for me I don't worry about colors now in this case I'm not crazy about this bar down here because it sort of obscures some of my data um, so I might go here and easily enough I go into design and I cho choose a different theme uh, you might want to create create some standard themes if your organization has not already done so. Um, there are a lot of different ways you can work with it. Again, you can have some fun with it. I would do the following. I would begin by creating a simple document in Word, a simple spreadsheet in Excel, and a simple PowerPoint presentation, and then practice your linking. Practice bringing data from one environment into another. Practice creating some uh, pivot tables in Excel and bringing them into PowerPoint and vice versa. Um, and, and remember as you go through this that the emphasis should really be on using the right tool for the right job. I see we've got about uh, five minutes left or so. Um, uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to, to uh, field them. And if I can't answer them uh, today, I'll certainly answer them in the next coming days. OK, Mike, it's Ellen. There are a couple of questions that the uh, participants have asked. So the first one goes back to a, a little bit in your presentation. But um, the question is, once you put the graph on the sheet with the data in Excel, can you also make a separate sheet with the graph by itself? I guess not in in not putting it in PowerPoint, but just making taking the graph separately from the Excel spreadsheet. Oh sure, Ab absolutely. Um, yeah, um, let me uh, let me get back to that. Um, where's my? Oh, hold on one second. Uh, uh, no, the thumb drive or the. the or not. Hold on one second while we yeah. while I get to that. Okay, sorry about that. I went out. Okay, great. That's perfect. Uh, okay, so if I go back to my uh, my DINFIB, okay, and I say, okay, I've got my uh, my, my uh, graph there. I can I can certainly take this and I can either present it just as it is, and I can I can print it, or I can um, uh, bring it over to Word, or I can do. Word whatever I want. So yes, you are not required by any stretch of the imagination to bring it over into PowerPoint. I'm just showing that we can we, we can create those linkages very easily. Okay. Um, next question. How did you get the pivot table to refresh? When I click refresh, my data is erased from my pivot table. Ah, okay. Well, let's go back to my uh, DINFIB list here in Excel. Okay, I, I assume the refresh the refreshing has to occur in Excel first. So let me do a quick pivot table. I'm going to say insert. Let's suppose I want to do a um, a, a list by doctor, by, doctor by a DINFIB reason. That'd be a good one that we haven't done yet. Okay, so I'm going to insert my pivot table. I'm going to say my doctor is going to be my row label. My DINFIB reason is going to be my column label, and I'm going to count how many times the doctor appears. So I've got a nice little graphic here, and excuse me, a little table here. Oops, excuse me, and I can see if any doctor, it looks like they're pretty evenly distributed here. Okay, let's now go back, and I'm going to call this um, uh, provider by DNFB down there. Let me now go back to my original data and let me change uh, a lot of these to Dr. Smith. Smith, 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 Smith. Okay. All right, we're really hammering Dr. Smith there. Okay, so now let's go back to our 
pivot table here. So let's keep our eye on Dr. Smith's data. He had seven before. I simply click somewhere inside the pivot table. I can't be out here. It won't refresh if I'm out here. You gotta be somewhere inside the pivot table and then I click on data and then I click refresh all. Keep your eye on that number seven down there, okay? Refresh all and now 25 for Dr. Smith. I now can go in here and I'm gonna create a graphic here. I'm gonna say insert a column chart, so I've got my column chart there. I can see my results there with Dr. Smith. I'm going to now copy that power, that, that graphic from Excel. I'm going to go into my DINFIB. I'm going to insert a new slide. I'm going to call it um, provider data. And now I'm going to do a link here. I can see my data here. I can see that Dr. Smith is really, really big. Okay, real big there. I'm going to go back to my DINFIB list. And I'm going to take all those away from Dr. Smith. And I'm going to give them to Dr. Jones. Let me give them a bunch to Dr. Jones. Okay, I'm going to now refresh my data here. Let's watch this number three that, that for Dr. Jones. I click somewhere inside the pivot table. I click data, refresh. She, Dr. Jones now has 22. It's changed her data here. Let's go back to my PowerPoint and let's see, cross my fingers, and Dr. Jones has been changed. Lucky me, boy, I'm, I'm sweating here. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, <clears throat> well, there is a question about pivot tables. Could you show us how to sure. create one? But I just wanted to mention to the person who um, also sent this is that we do have a lot of Mike's um, previous presentations on our YouTube channel, and you could go back there and review. However, Mike, did you have? Could you briefly sure. run through that? Sure. Sure. Um, Pivot tables are wonderful. Um, I, I would say of all the topics in Excel, boy, I really love both doing pivot tables and teaching pivot tables because a lot of people don't really use them all that often, and um, and and they're so useful. They're really the, the, probably the, the 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 most underutilized analytical tool in all of Excel that gives you the biggest bang for the buck. Let's start with the DINFIB list, okay? I've got, in fact, you know what? Let me do this. Let me change it back to the where it originally was. Let me pull it back because it's a little bit, a uh, little bit screwed up there. And let's see, where is my DINFIB current? There we go. Okay, so I'm back to my original data. The purpose of a pivot table, ladies and gentlemen, is to summarize the data. And if you recall from um, high school geometry, the teacher always talked about an x-axis and a y-axis. Well, that was really an important lesson. Generally, our y-axis is our vertical our x-axis is our horizontal, and when we put together a pivot table, we're basically taking all this information and we're going to be, present it in a summary fashion. It's very important to not have any blank columns and blank rows. What I'm able to do is I can take this information and pull it in and create a table that enables me to go in and and look at exactly what might be going on behind the scenes. So let's suppose I want to do something very simple. I want to know what the total charges are that are outstanding on DINFIB, and I want to look at it by payer. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to simply click on Insert, Pivot Table. It tells me what the range of my data is. My data is all this from column A to column J. I then click OK. I now build my pivot table, I'm going to say I want my payers here to be my row labels, and I'm going to put on the category of, of why the, the account is in DINFIB is going to be my column label. I'm then going to take the total charges from the, my field list, I'm going to bring them down to be the value section, and it's going to do a summary, and look what it does. It does. It, it it has taken my the the various categories that I've created. Oops, you know I didn't mean to use category. I meant to use reason. Sorry about that. 
But the reason why is an account being held in DINFIB and and what are the dollars associated with that? So I can see here that I've got again a pretty even distribution of accounts of of, of dollars associated. I've got um, except documentation is pretty low, but the other ones are all hovering around four five hundred thousand. I've got a problem here. It looks like with five hundred. Let's suppose I notice that my Blue Cross accounts here for coding are really egregious, Real, a lot of them there. There, Watch what happens when I double click on that 228150, watch this, I double click on that and it goes and it interrogates the information and it gets just my Blue Cross accounts that were being held for coding. It creates another sheet down below and I can go back to my DINFIB list and I can go back to my original data. I can go on and on. Um, I would encourage you to take a look at that, uh, the, those uh, links that are out there on pivot tables and uh, perhaps in the future we can do a, another uh, series uh, that uh, address that issue. In, and there are a lot of different ways you can go about uh, putting pivot tables together. This is just a, a very quick explanation of that. I could easily talk for an hour on nothing but pivot tables. Any other questions or Thanks, uh, Mike. Uh, no, I, there's no more questions in my, um, in my chat box, um, so I don't think there's any other questions at this time. Um, I just wanted to sum up again with um, the end of the presentation and, and thank everybody for attending. We really appreciate your participation. I feel fortunate to be able to provide these uh, webinars to you um, through some grant money that we received. So as I mentioned, um, if, you, if you have any ideas about um, what topics might be interest, interest, of interest to you going forward now, you know, Mike said he could talk for an hour on pivot tables. Maybe that's something we should do. Um, but <clears throat> so if you have any specific ideas about what would be really helpful for you in HIM, um, let us know because we, um, we would like to put out information for you professionals in the field and um, hopefully fill a need for uh, some training that you might not have gotten in the past. So again, thank you, Mike, for participating for these last six webinars that we've done. And um, hopefully we look forward to doing some more with you in the future. And again, thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it.